Good evening, everybody. Um, you know, I'm the Luddite in this room, I think. And this is a tough one because you give a topic like this to someone and what are they supposed to say? So I said, okay, let me use some time-tested methodology to do this. So I said, okay. Um, before I start to make my notes, I hunted around for some of the tools that could help me do this well. And I found it really worked well to figure out the future of media. This is a really, really... And that is why I'm with three things. is about the future of the media. The second part is, this is born out of 10 to 12 years. What is the future horizon of about 10 years? And lastly, we're going to see, and we are already seeing, ghettoization of consumption habits happening. And how that's, going to in, how that's going to impact everybody in this business is something only the future will tell us. What do I mean by more media? It is, you know, I know I'm speaking in a room of full of converted. So uh, the fact is that for the coming decade, this market is going to be about more television, more newspapers, more radio, and more of the same because, frankly, this market hasn't had enough of the same. So, you know, this industry is going to waste on this. And why do I say that? Look at where we stand on, I'm taking a market which is equal to India in terms of population. So on, on a lot of the metrics, we may not be equal to China, but on population, we are equal. So, so if you look at media penetration across these two markets, we, don't, we are not very good on, uh, on penetration. We are a very voluminous market, huge amounts of potential, but penetration is still low, except perhaps on cinema screens and newspapers. Penetration across the board in India is low, and monetization is even lower. We are less than one-fifth of the Chinese market on how we monetize this potential. And investors know that. If you look at where the investment has happened in the media and entertainment business in the last about seven, five to seven years, and back of the envelope, I'm talking $6 billion plus dollars of investment has gone into this business, where has the investment gone? It has gone into creating more and more infrastructure to either create media or to deliver media. So the, more and more of the money is going into things which reach media out to you or help create more media. So whether it's production studios and post-production studios and news bureaus, etc., on the supply side, or whether it is on the demand side, I mean, one of the largest pieces of investment has been DTH. Four billion dollars straight down the tube into DTH homes. So that's where all the money is going. And this has a direct correlation to people consuming more media, spending more time, more content being created, and all the things that we discuss happen when money goes into these things. And why do I say that? Over the 10 years that we've seen investments coming into the media business, this is what has happened. This is how audiences have grown. In television, they've doubled, more than doubled. In print, they've gone up. Films has gone down, but films has seen an increase in television. So, I mean, 16% of all national viewing time in this country is films across languages. Films has seen a huge ripple effect across other media. It drives the traffic for a lot of the other media that we see growth in. Uh, radio, internet, and, and, and I'm not included several segments here, but I've taken the big ones. I mean, TV is 50% of the media and entertainment industry in India, a little less than 50%. Revenue is up. Oh, I'm talking over the last decade. I've just taken two data points, 2000 and 2010, to tell you that investment into media infrastructure pays off in more revenues, it pays off in getting more audiences in, and it pays off in getting... Um, uh, a larger number of people into consuming media. And that is where, uh, and that's why I say we, we are, we're going to see more mass media and more, of this, uh, more growth in mass media. And that, to my mind, will help us address the, one of the biggest challenges this business faces, it has been facing, and it will continue to face for the next 10 to 15 years. And whatever we say about the growth of, of uh, devices, etc., the fact is, that this business is going to constantly struggle for scale. And why do I say that? 
Uh, quickly, <clears throat> some of those figures may be from 2009, some of them are 2010, but roughly this is, this is what the landscape looks like. And we're talking about two companies in the billion dollar, two groups in the billion dollar range. We're talking about eight or 10 of them in the 1,200 to 15, um, two of them in the 3,000, two to 3,000, and about eight or 10 of them are the 1,200, 1,500 crore range. A bulk of the media companies in this country are in the 50 to 100 crore range. We are very, very small compared to our potential. And I'm not saying let's compare it to a Comcast or a Disney. I mean, $55 billion, $41 but Those are not the numbers I'm looking at. I'm saying let's look at India, okay? Here's the perspective. The largest mobile phone company in this country is $12 billion. It's three-fourths the size of the media industry in this country. That tells you how small this industry is. The Brazilian TV market has less than half the TV homes India has, but they have double the margins we have. The US, I know, I know US is not a good example to use, mature markets, very good prices, etc. but really I think this statistic always makes me upset when we say in world's largest filmmaking country, it's a rubbish claim to have. Because the U.S. film industry makes five times the money India does with half those films. And I'm talking domestic box office. I'm not talking global box office. Uh, what we have is a problem of scale at both industry level and at the firm level. And the U.S. example or the Brazil example is just simply to tell you what our audience potential could be delivering but is not delivering. And this problem stems... I mean, I've, I've done this for perspective, but we could easily skip this and move on. But the point is, we could keep adding homes and yet only grow marginally. I mean, if you went to 100% of TV homes, you'll add a billion dollars to top line, to this industry. That's about the impact that you'll have, okay? Why is it that we can't grow? What is the problem? And why is scale such an issue, whether at the firm or the industry level? It's an issue because pricing power is limited, extremely fragmented. You can't raise prices with advertisers because there's fragmentation. You can't raise prices with consumers because most days consumers either don't want to pay or there's regulation or fragmentation is so high that the next guy will chop you out on pricing. And I think anybody in this room who runs a media company or who runs a media business will know what this pressure is about. Again, my favorite industry to look at, because the numbers are easier to get by, look at television. Look at what has happened to television in the last 10 years. From about, uh, we were about 40 million homes, uh, perhaps, oh yeah, it, about 40 million homes in 2000, and we, are 130, we were 134 million homes in 2010. We were about 70 channels in 2000, 604 television channels in 2010. We are 715 right now. Look at the operating margins. They've fallen from 30% to 13%. I mean, that's the kind of margins you had at the net level, not at operating level for most businesses. And, and this is true, by the way, across media segments. So even if penetration rises, our problem of scale will continue till you see some consolidation happening, till you see some pricing power coming back to this market. Because we can be the largest market in the world for everything. But it, it, it doesn't mean anything until it reaches a certain size and there's a certain level of profitability to continue investing in the future. And that brings me to the last bit on what I see in the future. The ghettoization of media consumption. And what do I mean by that? You know, in the old days when you and I, and I, when I say old days, it doesn't mean 50 years back. I'm just going back five or 10 years back. If you picked up the newspaper or a magazine or you know, you surfed across uh, on a television channel, you'd willy-nilly come across something that you liked mildly, that interested you mildly. You might not have read, but you know, okay, it was interesting, so I read. I remember reading this entire one and a half full page article in uh, Wall Street Journal on this reporter's search for the hottest chili in the world. And it was on a busy day in office, but I managed to read it because it just pulled me in. But what you would end up doing is you'd end up reading about a lot of things which you wouldn't have read or seen or got exposed to earlier. Media is more democratized now, there's more choice, there's more variety in content, in formats, in devices, you name it across the board, there's far more democratization of media. We can choose what we want to read, watch, or listen to. And the power may vary across media, but we have that power to choose. And what do we do? We have more media, but we limit our choices. We limit our choices of our own volition. 
We have more specialized consumption. Our consumption is more about me, myself, my tastes, and my world. Like I said, these are just observations. These are not value judgments. There's no right or wrong here. This is just what is happening. Uh, and, you know, I would say a Twitter feed is a classic example. I, I myself am a victim of this. A Twitter feed, I mean, it, it, we tailor it to th look at things that interest us. What that does, and I'm sure a lot of academics are going to be doing work on this, what this does is it ghettoizes us to a certain subject or area or point of view. There is a danger there of becoming blinkered or being completely surprised when we see another point of view which has been around for long, but because we weren't looking around. Because there was no serendipity in our media consumption, because we had decided that this is what I want to follow and this is what I want to see, and I follow a lot of media stuff around the world, and I sometimes get surprised when I'm reading something else on, let's say, what is happening in China or what's happening in Japan. And I think because we don't allow enough serendipity into our media consumption habit, we don't notice a lot of the other things or pieces. And I'll use an example or digress a bit to use an example to uh, tell you what I'm saying here and why it may matter in the future. It is a subtextual point, but it may matter in the future. Why would it matter? You know, 10 years back, 15 years back, there was this whole thing about what, is, what are new media devices doing to our reading habits, blah, 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 blah. And then there was all this academic research around it, and you know, there was these articles in Atlantic Monthly and Slate and blah, blah. And it all came out, and a lot of research showed that new media devices actually have uh, chipped away at our ability to read, absorb, or reflect on information. And, and it's a normal human. It happens, it's happened to the best of readers that we tend to browse, we tend to power read, we want looking for hyperlinks. We are we, all of us become power readers at some point. We can't take in text beyond a certain point. And what has happened when that happens? We become distracted viewers, distracted readers, distracted surfers. In which, whichever ways, we become a distracted media consumer. And what, guess what happens when we become distracted? Everybody tries to aggregate us. So everybody wants to get this big aggregated consumer mass together so that they can serve advertising to us. Because the more distracted we, we are, to get a large mass of together, it's only by getting a large mass of us together that the advertiser can seem to make sense. And I'm, again, I keep saying that this is referring to the market in India, and as we go further, what happens to that? So the market attaches a premium to our ability to concentrate, absorb. And you have to wonder what premium it would attach to serendipity. Just think about it, because and why do I say that? An online reader commands less than 14 times the ad rates that an offline one in an old-fashioned newspaper does in the US. I'm talking about the world's largest online market, advertising market. Your friend and you may watch Frasier at the same time last night, but the advertiser will pay for you if you're watching it on TV. He'll pay peanuts for the friend who's watching it online. So the fact is that the market is still attaching a value to your power to see this without any distractions, with, with total concentration. And their market is still attaching a value to serendipity. Notice that in India, newspapers are the most profitable news segment, media segment to be in. They are the only healthy, profitable media industry in India. And they will continue to remain that for 10 years. So this is a, it's a thought. So as we scale up and increase penetration, et cetera, there are all these subtextual changes. And I think both advertisers and media owners will have to tackle them and will have to look at them. Because you know, we are talking about net penetration of 1,100 million. We are talking about 873 million, 900 million mobile phones. It's all going to come upon us very soon in a big wave. And that is a thought I'll leave you with. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.